Good day, Dr. Ron here with a cybersecurity update for September 12th, 2022. Uh, again, my work is for students, researchers, professionals, and all those interested in learning a tidbit about cybersecurity and some of the issues that we have going on in our field that keep us active, busy, and engaged. Got a few topics for today. India says it's uncovered fraudulent shell companies with uh, Chinese links. In a way, that's this is kind of how a lot of criminal organizations in the U.S. and U.K. also operate. So I wanted to mention this just briefly so you are aware of it. Secondly, Microsoft warns of ransomware attack by Iranian phosphorus hacker group. We talked about this last week. Uh, but in this article that I'm presenting this week, it has a really good graphic on the attack chain I wanted to highlight with you and provide you with a link so you can have that if you're doing some research or some investigation or studying for a cert exam. Next, 200,000 North Face accounts hacked in credential stuffing attack. And I want to mention to you what credential stuffing is. It's sort of like a variation of brute force attack. We'll talk about what the differences are. HP fixes severe uh, bug in pre-installed support assistant tool. Very common item on HP products. So the commonality, the way it's deployed on a DLL is pretty important too. Uh, let's see, this is number five. Ransomware attack leading to Georgia Art College leads to uh, data leak. Again, more ransomware attacks on educational institutions, whether it's K through 12 or college university. Another example here. Uh, finally, we've talked about IoT devices and how hackable they are, but AMTSO publishes guidance for testing IoT security products. We'll take a quick look at that as well. Uh, just a few notes on this presentation and all the presentations I do. For educational purposes, training, certification, it's under the fair use. I don't share anything secret. Everything is gathered from publicly available sources. I do provide you with those links. If you want to dig in deeper, if you're doing some research, either for school or, or on your own, or perhaps even doing setting for a cert exam, you'll have those here. Uh, first off, this is a quick note here. Um, in uh, Indian authorities on Sunday said they had arrested a man who had masterminded the creation, creation of many shell companies linked to China and appointed dummy directors to run the fraudulent businesses. So it was a hacking theft business com combo, if you will. And a lot of shell organizations in the U.S., U.K. are set up in a similar fashion. Basically, shell organizations are used to hide the identities of uh, the individuals running the organizations. And they obfuscate, if you will, uh, by using a bunch of fake directors. In this case, in India, uh, the fake directors of multiple shell companies were listed by using Indian citizens with no education. I think that what this was pointing out to is no technical education. Uh, just folks off the street uh, who were working menial jobs. So I'm sure if they were asked by Indian authorities, it would be like this blank stare. So this is used to obfuscate who's hidden behind the scenes, if you will. Uh, again, you can think of information theft probably with these folks as well who had no idea what was going on. This is a similar pattern that is in use to obfuscate the identities um, throughout uh, organizations that are running illegal hack, hacking conglomerates <laughs> groups in the U.S. So this is a point of interest, a point to note as well. Uh, first um, item, this actually the second item, we talked about the Iranian Phosphorus Group last week. Uh, Microsoft's threat intelligence, as a recap, on Wednesday assessed that a subgroup of the Iranian threat actor uh, Phosphorus is conducting ransomware attack as a, and I laughed last week about it, this, as a form of moonlighting for personnel ga personal gain. Uh, so anyway, personal gain. That kind of makes me chuckle. This whole thing is really personal gain. It's theft. Uh, Dev280 also, I'm sorry, Dev0270, aka Nemesis Kitten, love the names, said it uh, operated a company that functions under the public aliases Seknard and LifeWeb, citing infrastructure overlaps between the group and two organizations. So uh, again, a state-sponsored group, whether it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, etc., uh, also will often create similar to our department division division department structure in the U.S. for a legal company, where that department or a subgroup like Seknard or LifeWeb is focused on a particular aspect. They, one aspect might be focused on, let's say, South Korea. Another uh, group might be also focused on banking in the U.S. So that would be their focus. They would use similar tools as well. Um, 
I had mentioned this, they're using uh, living off the land binaries, LOL bins. And this is kind of an interesting twist because they're really using um, a part of the existing um, operating system against itself. So we'll talk about LOL bins uh, in a future session. I'll have it posted a up as a separate session, not as part of the cybersecurity update. But with this one, I wanted to inter introduce you. This particular article had a really nice uh, graphic in it. And this may be something of use to you when, in your studying or if you're building out a paper on cybersecurity. Uh, this is the attack chain. You have the attacker. I may have it kind of masked a little bit, but you see the attacker over the um, left-hand side. Uh, bottom line with this whole chain, you can read the details through. But it's reconnaissance, as we've talked about before. So the attacker will do some recon, see what kind of systems they have, whether or not those systems are outdated or when they're patched, how what kind of network layout they have, the architecture. If it's flat network, it's easier for them to bounce around. Uh, they'll, um, that's the discovery port point. They'll attempt to do some sort of credential compromise, perhaps with social engineering uh, link that a user clicks on. Then uh, uh, once they get into that, the permissions, they will attempt to either laterally move over, discover, do some more recon, or and or escalate privileges in order to hack things. And of course, one of the things you'll want to do, uh, or an attacker does, is kind of uh, defeat the log files, uh, defeat any kind of tracking mechanisms that are in the system itself in order to hide themselves a little bit better. Uh, there could be some timing issues as well. They don't want to be slamming up against, let's say, a database if they're doing some kind of queries. They may want to take it nice and slow in order not to set off any alerts as well. So there's all of that background that's kind of expressed a bit in this attack chain right here. Uh, the bottom line is, Ultimately, the organization is impacted at one shape and form, whether the attacker hides in wait for a year uh, doing their investigation, but at one point in time, uh, they have the keys to the kingdom and they steal the, the data and run away with it. <laughs> North Face. Love North Face. This is a great company. Uh, they also have been an attack. By the way, just I, I kind of transitioned pretty quickly, but if you're looking at an attack, vector, an attack methodology. Look at the prior article. It's, it's really well laid out. So getting into this article, again, I'm not going to do much editing on these because I do want to present these pretty quickly to you. Um, outdoor Apparel, North Face, uh, uh, 200,000 accounts on the northface.com were stolen. And they used a thing called credential sniffing. It's similar to brute force attack, but credential sniffing is Stuffing is where threat actors use email addresses, usernames, and password combinations obtained from data breaches to attempt to hack it into user accounts. Now, they could sometimes get the stuffing information, the data, from the dark web. You know, perhaps another organization similar um, uh, where users may be, some of the profiles could be similar. That could be targeted. Let's say REI. I don't know if REI is out there, but that would be an educational example. If someone's selling REI information, I may be tempted to take that file that I purchased for um, whatever, half a Bitcoin, and, and then bounce it up against this website, a couple other similar websites. I could be stuffing those credentials into this site, and all of a sudden, voila, I'm starting to get some hits because people who use REI, uh, North Face, etc., I have similar accounts. So that could be one method of that. The success of these attacks relies on the practice of password recycling too, where a person uses the same credentials across multiple online platforms. Now this speaks to varying your passwords always, no matter what site, and also to frequently update your passwords, perhaps every few months, and using technologies when provided like MFA multi-factor and uh, use perhaps a password manager. That would be even really a good way to do things for us. And uh, I'm mentioning that because that would be, all of those items would be mentioned in part of a, a certification, or if you're taking a course, if it's on a course in information security, those items would be mentioned as well. So credential stuffing versus brute force attack. Uh, credential stuffing, again, is similar to brute force attack, but there are several differences that I want to highlight here. Brute force attack, tries to guess credentials. Let's say if you have a 16 position password, brute force will just try spinning all possible combinations there. Uh, used uh, with password patterns or dictionaries perhaps of common phrases. So you can get those 
dictionaries out on the web and then you can use that as part of the brute force say hey use this dictionary and in addition add on to that uh, with the brute force attack tool secondly brute force <laughs> brute force attacks try to guess credentials with no context using random strings commonly used password patterns dictionaries common phrases third brute force attacks succeed if users choose simple guessable passwords and if you're studying passwords look at the common look at uh, I think there's a list of a hundred most common passwords something like that do a Google search you'll see things like password password one A B C D E F G one two three four five etc so those are really kind of dumb passwords but a lot of folks will use them also uh, this is kind of a side note but if you have common products let's say you get a router a switch uh, oftentimes if it's off the shelf type of router switch they have a default password you can find default passwords on the web as well to a lot of common products so um the last one on here brute force attacks lacks black context and that's the important thing it's starting from a, a pretty basic idea with a brute force attack again you're using perhaps dictionaries you're expanding on those but you're starting out with a basic idea whereas Credential sniffing, as I had mentioned, you're starting with kind of a more of an intelligent base. So if you are buying, again, I'm restating this, if you're getting something from the web, let's say it's an REI hack and, you, and you're slamming it against here, you're stuffing those credentials into this website. Key points here. On August 26th, North Face, they uh, began recognizing something kind of wonky, perhaps multiple uh, logon attempts, etc. So uh, the activity... Uh, was noted on August 11th, so it took about two weeks for them to kind of understand what the heck was going on. Of course, it, this kind of culling through information takes a lot of recon research on our side with protecting an organization. There could be additional tools in the North Face use that either aren't revealed here, or maybe they didn't have full, uh, those t tools to support them fully deployed. Anyway, um, they were able to stop the attack almost a full month later on August 19th. Attackers only got some minor information, wink, wink, nod, nod, like full name, purchase history, billing address, shipping address, telephone number, account creation date, gender, XPLR, which is their past reward records, uh, payment details like the credit card data, and that was probably due to PCI DSS compliance, was stored elsewhere and secured in a different manner, not revealing how they did it, of course, they would be crazy to do so, but look up PCI DSS, that's a compliance model for uh, credit card information that vendors in the United States need to use. Uh, so uh, that being said, uh, we had credential stuffing here. There's some information called from somewhere else that was slammed up against this uh, website. And we also have PCI DSS involved here. Two good items to think about for, creden um, for certification, if you will. Next, this is a, an idea of a common um, piece of software that was that a lot of folks have if you're using HP um, more than likely you have this on your device I know I do on my HP over here uh, HP issued a security advisor alerting users about a newly discovered vulnerability in HP support assistant software that uh, comes pre-installed on all HP laptops and desktop computers including the Omen subbrand HP support assistant I have a snapshot of what that looks like um, on the next screen uh, it does the hardware diagnostic test uh, dive, dives deeper in the technical specs uh, the, the bios it does all those little nifty things uh, there again on the bottom is the cve score once it's recognized put it in the national vulnerability database that gets distributed uh, and also like i had mentioned before attackers can look at that national vulnerability database use it as a recon measure uh, the score 2022 today's year a uh, 38,395 down the chain and here's what it looks like the scoring uh, by the way if you look at first.org they give you kind of a scoping you know, I like the graphic the visual if you will this tells you where it kind of falls into uh, the scope if you look at the CIA which is on the right hand side confidentiality integrity availability and by the way if you're studying cybersecurity CIA triad and there's an extended CIA triad that some books don't even mention look at the CIA triad first then look for the extended CIA triad but in a, in a way they're looking at confidentiality integrity availability and high impact so that's why this gets the the bonus score of 8.2 which means if it's red you got to fix it like yesterday anyway um this is a screenshot like i had mentioned of where you would see this uh, item it's really this optimized system performance this attack was done through a dll dynamic link library 
And uh, that's one of the ways that attackers get in a software chain. Uh, let's see some other I, second item down. I talked about some of these other items, but DLL hijacking happens when a malicious actor places a DLL. So a DLL is a, a software object, if you will, dynamic link library containing the malicious code on the same folder or within the same folder as the abused executable, exploiting Windows logic to prioritize these libraries against DLL in the System32 directory. A couple items here. Not only, it's it's almost like, conceptually, it's almost like having a Word document with a macro, a DLL with a bad piece of code. Um, you can put it in the same folder. There's a thing called now, uh, now it's called uh, a signing, object signing, if you will, that um, um, is starting to get into play in the software security where uh, objects are then signed and verified by the system. However, this was, isn't the case with this particular item, the DLL. If your machine is has been compromised, it'll pull in that attack, that compromised DLL, use that, and then you're basically owned. So patch your machines. Another item, we talked about how schools K-12 through Colleges and universities have been kind of in the crosshairs as of late with ransomware groups. So Savannah College of Art and Design, a really well-known college, 15,000 uh, students. Uh, this, they've been attacked by cyber. I'm sorry, ransomware. The school hired a third-party cybersecurity expert who isolated the incident and launched an investigation. So that's cool. What well, that tells me that the school probably didn't have um, a large IT environment nor large IT support staff. So appropriately so they reached out to a third party to kind of get a handle on this so here's a quote due to the university's early detection and rapid response the incident had no operational impact to the university now it's operational so the university was still running however there is an impact i do want to talk about because sometimes you get these little blurbs from organizations that say oh things are okay but there's still smoke pouring out in the back room i think this is the case here so let's look at this uh, the, the school said it already notified all the people who had information access during the attack and provided them with ways to protect themselves. So this really tells me that even they, they say, oh, everything's all just fine. They still had a notification of uh, telling a lot of students that their information was compromised. So let's look at that. A couple of things on this slide. Over to the right-hand side, the Twitter feed basically saying uh, Avos Locker Ransomware Group, again, another ransomware group, added SCAD, the um, Savannah College of Art and Design, to its leak site, giving the school a two-week deadline to pay an undisclosed ransom. The group claims to have stolen a database of phone numbers, email addresses, and more. Experts at Data Breaches Net examined the data leaked by Avos Locker and found the group managed to take at least 69,000 files that contain student information, personal files, and business data. Again, this gets back to the organization saying, everything's okay. However, uh, the data breaches net examined what Avos Locker took, and it contained that many 69,000 files, student information, which should be housed in a separate location on the network, personnel files, should be housed in a secure enclave, business data, another secure enclave. So this kind of infers that they may have been using a flat network structure of some sort, perhaps. So if you're studying cybersecurity, look at uh, network architecture in particular, how you can segment that architecture, make secure enclaves, and also within each secure enclave, you do the IM process to verify the authenticity, authentication of that traffic in and outside of that uh, secure enclave. Just as an example. Uh, so the hack included passports. They probably were doing like an I-9 process or some sort of, uh, you know, foreign students coming over. They needed their passports. That information was taken. Bank statements. I don't know what, maybe for federal student aid. Uh, disciplinary files and other documents that contain social security numbers according to data breaches. Uh, the ransomware group call, told the website that SCAD allegedly no negotiated with the hacking group for an undisclosed ransom amount, but did not end up paying. So I think there was some sort of confusion. That's what I get from this article. Um, incident reporting and incident response plan. That's that's something that an organization should have dialed in. Incident re response plan is an overarching, like keep it up on your shelf. If something happens, pull that document down. Who gets contacted? Who do you contact? I'd say put it in a printed document, because especially if your systems are locked up, you can't get to it. So have an incident response plan already dialed in, printed up. Uh, that way, if something happens, you pull that out and you know who to call. Secondly is an incident reporting plan. 
who do you report to? I mean, if it's PCI DSS, you know, if you got credit card data being stolen, you may report one way. If you have the theft of other information being stolen, HIPAA, you might report that way. You might have to report several different uh, ways in, in based on the type of data that you're hosting. So that needs to also be dialed in. And finally, here on this last slide, uh, a few colleges, universities, as of late, that have been attacked by ransomware. Maloney College, Savannah State, the University of Detroit Mercy, Centralia College, Phillips Community College, University of Arkansas National University College, North Carolina AT&T University, FIU, Florida International, et cetera, et cetera. So we target colleges and universities are in the crosshair right now. A great resource of information. They have money. They have a lot of PII. They have HIPAA information. Oh, and even if they, they're doing research, DOD information, what a great, and a lot of colleges and universities have thin IT staff. In other words, perhaps they need eight more people when they only, only have three working it, for example. So we've got a lot of issues in this space. In particular, ransomware is a wonderful way that hackers can leverage that weakness. Uh, Security Week, talking about weaknesses. Uh, IoT devices, we've mentioned this before. IoT devices in general are made on the cheap. They're not designed for security. They're made, if you designed an IoT device, I don't know, some device that you have uh, and you had really good security, it may cost, you might have to sell it for $100. Whereas if you had little or very limited security or no security on it at all, Maybe you could sell it for $10 an item. You'd probably sell a heck of a lot more $10 items. So that's kind of the business model of IoT devices is sell on the cheap, not made for security. However, this uh, organization right here, the Anti-Malware Testing Standards Organization, AMTSO, has published guidelines for testers and vendors looking to check the effective, effect, efficacy, if you will, and functionality of security on IoT devices. So some companies will probably just ignore it. They'd rather create the $10 products and sell a bazillion of them, uh, whereas others uh, will want to have a certain level of certification and trust, et cetera, so they, that way they can steer and they can even market their products as secure IoT products. I'm including this in particular. If you're studying um, security, especially IoT, and I'll even include the SCADA on this, um, uh, they have a link in this article that will download with PDF, uh, and it's it's straight from the AMTSO organization. It doesn't ask for your email, all that other kind of crap. <laughs> so you'll get that document there. It's really a way that things are leaning towards in the IoT uh, SCADA area. And if you're securing networks, um, this is a good um, document to uh, peruse right now. Finally, all these references, I'll. Uh, provide them here certainly but they're also in the notes for the YouTube video as well so I've I hope you've enjoyed this a couple of items please like please share that way I get to know if you're using this information if it, you find it useful subscribe this will give you notifications on new posts I plan on doing um, one or two of these a week um, with a little bit of my commentary about ideas to thoughts to study if you will please keep in contact if you have any questions about this material uh, post a question in the comments uh, if you have any suggestions as well. I'd like I'd like to hear back from you. That way I can kind of gear my training materials, my contribution to our community towards what everyone needs. If you need a little more support in a certain area, say, hey, Ron, perhaps a SCADA. Uh, we can talk about that as well. Perhaps IoT, more in-depth, more DLL info, etc. I will be putting out um, additional training videos as well, but I want to hear back on on whether I should work on that one versus this one. So that will help me out. So please like it, uh, help me out here, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much.